All right, can you hear me well? Well, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, very stirring challenge uh, and very encouraging message to all of us. And I want to welcome everyone who's uh, graciously and generously agreed to be part of this synod. Um, and to Bishop Ricken for coming to join us this evening, and I'm sure we'll be, uh, we'll be delighted and uh, moved by what he has to say to uh, reinvigorate our faith and the faith of our, our local church. My uh, task this evening uh, is not so much uh, motivational, as it's a little bit more prosaic, but that is to say something about an overview that I see uh, that is the context for having a synod in our archdiocese. And I would like to start off by saying that I had not been a bishop very long in 2002 when I remember attending that awful meeting of bishops in Dallas about the sexual abuse crisis. And when I came back uh, to Ohio, I within a few weeks, even a few days really, it was time to go to World Youth Day with Pope John Paul in Toronto. So I went, um, not entirely encouraged by things, and uh, I'll never forget what it was like to be with the Holy Father and to see 800,000 young adults gathered in an open field for this closing mass. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced looking out at 800,000 people. But what was most important was the presence of the Holy Father and what he had to say. And I would like to just briefly, uh, by way of context, uh, quote something that he said. And this is a theme that I think Bishop Ricken is going to focus on. And I'm not meaning to steal your uh, message or your thunder. but. This is what Pope St. John Paul said. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Our personal encounter with Christ bathes us in new light, sets us on the right path, and sends us out to be his witnesses. This new way of looking at the world and at people, which comes to us from him, leads us more deeply into the mystery of faith, which is not just a collection of theoretical assertions to be accepted and approved by the mind, but an experience to be had, a truth to be lived, the salt and light of all reality. Let the gospel be the measure and guide of life's decisions and plans. Then you will be missionaries in all that you do and say, and wherever you work and live, you will be signs of God's love, credible witnesses to the living presence of Jesus Christ. Never forget, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel. These were the words of our sainted Pope. And it was Pope St. Paul VI before him and Popes Benedict and Francis after him who have repeated these themes over and over again. What is Pope St. John Paul saying? Jesus Christ is a living person. You know, sometimes when I seem to be uh, downcast at the, what we uh, experience in the world today and in the church, I simply remind myself Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive and he's in charge. He's true God and true man. Yet many Catholics are put off when they're asked whether they have a personal relationship with him, as if there were something they had never thought about and think of it as a strange notion to have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ risen from the dead. I remember in Detroit once, my hometown, an old pastor told me that he was at a very contentious parish council meeting. I know that never happens in the Archdiocese of Hartford. <laughs> but, and 
he, at a certain point, said, well, we need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? And some man said, what does Jesus have to do with any of this? <laughs> I rest my case. Jesus is alive. He's not dead. And he is the way, the truth, and the light. Not one among many, even though we have great respect in a pluralistic world for other faiths or religions, but not among many. He's the only one. Yet, so many Catholics, as Pope uh, St. John Paul says, approach their religion only as a collection of theoretical assertions to be accepted and approved by the mind rather than as an experience to be had, a truth to be lived, and the salt and light of all reality. And finally, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be sent on a mission in life. Every life, not just the priesthood and the vowed life of a religious. As the recently canonized St. John Henry Newman said, each of us has a mission that's not entrusted to anyone else. And if we have a God-given mission, then that makes each of us missionaries. What did Jesus say? No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel. All of this is the context for what Pope Francis calls missionary discipleship. Personal and communal, learned and experienced, lived and shared. Now, these fundamental truths are pure gospel and have always been true, even though they've been lived in very different ways through 2,000 years of history. And these truths are absolutely essential for understanding and discerning what we're about in this synod, a way forward for our local church, our archdiocese, within the communion of the universal Catholic Church. The fact that we have Christ's promise that the bark of Peter will not sink does not mean that our only task is to rearrange the deck chairs in the face of today's serious challenges. What are our challenges today on the stormy seas on which we find ourselves? Well, numbers are not everything. They do not tell the whole story, but consider the following statistics about the Archdiocese of Hartford. Between 1965 and 2015, a 50-year period, the Archdiocese has experienced a 27% decline in Catholic population, a 74% decline in infant baptisms, a 76% de decline in Catholic marriages, an 88% decline in seminarians, a 65% decline in archdiocesan priests, a 78% decline in religious sisters, a 69% decline in average mass attendance, a 56% decline in the number of parochial elementary schools, and an 81% decline in parochial school students. If Jesus is not alive, I'm going home, because these are very startling and discouraging statistics. We speak often about a shortage of priests but as these statistics show, the shortage is only one aspect of a much deeper phenomenon. And it's not just a Catholic crisis. Maybe we can take some, I don't say comfort, but some perspective from the fact that it is not just a Catholic crisis. Just ask most Eastern Orthodox bishops in our country, or mainline Protestant ministers, or ask the rabbis and you will find we are not alone. Perhaps we can take consolation from my favorite saying from an old Jesuit, that the truth sets you free, but first it makes you miserable. <laughs> ah, yes, it is. There's a lot of wisdom in that. The truth sets you free, 
but first it makes you miserable. If you want to know my principal hope for this synod, it is that the synod will help transform us from an archdiocese that is managing decline that these startling and daunting percentages represent into an archdiocese that is disrupting this decline, this pattern of decline, disrupting it with a view to the next 10 or 20 years by a willingness to do what Pope St. John Paul, citing scripture, challenged us to do at the turn of the millennium. And what were his words from scripture in Latin? Duke in altum. I thought it meant put up your dukes, but it doesn't. <laughs> Duke in altum, Jesus told his apostles, means go out into the deep. Go out into the deep. You are fishers of men, so go out into the deep when you're not making a good catch, and there you will find the fish. You know, as a bishop, a successor of the apostles, I too have to see myself not only as a pastor, that is to say a shepherd, but also as a fisherman in the stormy sea of the church and the world today. It's not just, you know, Cardinal Dolan once made a, well, he makes a lot of funny remarks, but he did at the, in our bishop's conference, and he was president. He said, you know, today, People want to be part of Christ's flock, but they think they're a sheep of one. They don't care about the other sheep or being part of it. They think they're all by themselves. But it's not just sheep. It's also making a catch of fish. In preparation for the Synod, I attended listening sessions throughout the Archdiocese among you, the laity, religious, and clergy, and we asked three questions. What is the Archdiocese doing well? What is the Archdiocese doing not so well? And what is the Archdiocese not doing that it should be doing? And I encountered a whole range of responses, as you might imagine. Some responded as though the percentages I mentioned a moment ago didn't exist. They're oblivious to these changes. Some wanted to preserve their own corner of the archdiocese just as it is and let others cope with reality, with change. And still others were positive and thoughtful in searching for a way forward in the midst of today's realities. The results of these listening sessions <clears throat> form the basis for further consultation and collaboration leading to the documentation and pr propositions that form the nucleus of your deliberations for the Synod. And having been part of the process so far, and having reflected now for a long time on my responsibilities in the context of the whole church, my overall hopes for this archdiocese are these. That we get out from under the buildings and even institutions of the past that no longer serve or further the church's mission today. That we address boldly and realistically the things that weigh on the presbyterate and work to provide a way forward for the renewal of our priests, their pastoral care, their preaching and celebration of the liturgy that we transform those things that have been largely instructional about the faith into that which is transformational. You know, you can know the catechism which I have worked on with Bishop Ricken, with the Bishop's Conference with Rome, that we worked on so hard, and I think fruitfully and successfully for many years, about accurately, authentically, expressing and teaching the doctrines of our faith. But my brothers and sisters, even the devil knows the catechism from cover to cover. That alone is not enough. It has to be transformational, that what we believe makes a difference then in how we live and what we do and our participation in the church. That we rethink our structure 
to identify, encourage, and give scope for lay witness in parish life. Not just tasks, but witness. You know, these World Youth Days, I've always been so impressed when young people in the evening before the, the conclusion or the big mass get up in front of the Pope and give their personal testimonies of faith. That's not something we Catholics are accustomed to, but we have to find some way to learn to do that. To give a witness, a testimony of faith to uh, others uh, in, in uh, our parish life. And finally, to restore Catholic devotional life as a very Catholic way of having a personal encounter with Christ, Our Lady, and the Saints. When Catholics hear personal encounter with Christ, they think of fundamentalists, and they, it's, it doesn't make sense. But if you talk about the tradition of uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, where Christ is present, or the rosary and devotions, and devotions to the saints. Those are the personal, the personal face of Christ, Mary, and the saints in the Catholic tradition. And I really believe that we need to restore that devotional life in a very healthy and evangelical way. Now, since becoming your Archbishop in December of 2013, we have undertaken, and I say we, because it's not me alone, but many dedicated clergy and religious, we have undertaken significant steps to plan for a more vibrant future. To my way of thinking, perhaps the most important thing I've done is to direct every parish to have at least one hour of Eucharistic adoration per week and to have consecrated our Archdiocese to Mary under the title of Mother of the Church, a consecration I renew at the cathedral every year on the day of priestly ordinations. As for good, good stewardship, we're in a process of, as you know, right-sizing our parishes and their number so that they correspond to the people and clergy we actually have and not what used to be and is gone with a view to a more vibrant parish life and to fulfilling our spiritual mission. Similarly, there's an ongoing major restructuring of the central service offices and ministries of the Archdiocese itself to correspond to today's needs and realities and to bring them together in a united effort and not so many independent entities operating in isolation. I think of particular importance has been the revitalization of the Office of Evangelization, Education, and Catechesis which addresses the very heart of missionary discipleship. Good stewardship in financial matters is also at work in these major changes at the parish level as well as the archdiocesan. Not only are parishes disposing of properties that are no longer needed, but so is the archdiocese, including the pending sale of the archbishop's residence which certainly served a good purpose in its day, but is no longer needed now that the archdiocesan activities are focused on the pastoral center in Bloomfield. And for those of you who saw the lead role played by Mr. Puppo the Beagle in one of the fast videos, he is the dog that belongs to Father Bogoslawski, and he's part of the house where I do live now at Nylon Hall at, uh, in Bloomfield. So we have a happy home there, and I'm very pleased uh, that uh, everything has worked out so well to make this transition to a new kind of, of situation. Also with regard to temporalities, an audited financial report of the Archdiocese is now being published annually. And with the creation of the Hartford Bishops Foundation, we have a major lay-led instrument for developing financial resources to strengthen parish life, lifelong education, Catholic charities, and even future innovation. And the foundation is also meant to be outward looking, to engage the wider community, to be sure that the church does not turn in on itself, but remains a significant contributor to the common good of society. 
I also have sought to be fully transparent about clerical sexual abuse, which has so grievously wounded the faith of so many. By the information that's been published for our Catholic people and the general public, by the steps that we've taken to identify offenders, to provide safe environments for children and vulnerable adults, and to try to make amends in some way, however inadequate, for these crimes and sins. We await the results of Judge Rabina's independent investigation of what has transpired in the Archdiocese going all the way back to 1953 with regard to the sexual abuse of minors. And right now we're also taking steps to implement a national reporting system for accusations against bishops as directed by the Holy See in Rome. Before concluding, let me say something that I think is absolutely essential, without which we could not be the Catholic Church founded by Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the profession of faith that each of you made in order to be appointed as delegates to this body, and hopefully you've read the U.S. Adult Catechism. A formal profession of faith is not a dead letter. It is inspired and upheld by the Holy Spirit in faithful hearts. It was Saint Boniface, an Englishman who in the 8th century brought Christianity to what is now Germany and who was martyred there for the faith, who once wrote something that I always uh, think of as uh, in these days. He said, the truth it can be wearied, but it cannot be overcome. The truth can be wearied, but it cannot be overcome. God knows that the truths that the church believes and teaches, especially about the equal dignity and rights of every person for a lifetime from conception until natural death, the creation of the human person by God in two distinct but complementary sexes, and marriage as an exclusive lifelong union between one man and one woman open to the procreation of children. These are just some of the God-given truths that are subject today either to being called oppressive, unjust, uh, and, uh, or giving rise to skepticism and scorn, radical questioning and rejection. For an increasing number of people, there is a growing belief that human beings are capable of being defined or redefined and even creating themselves. They reject and resent any notion that there is an absolute God-given truth that might contradict their desires. Pope Francis has said we face this challenging task of evangelizing in our time, which he says is not so much an age of change as it is the change of an age. And I think he's really right about that. It's not just an age of change, but the change of an age. We have to accompany people in situations that reflect this sea change in our world, in our culture. But we must do so with fidelity to the truths of faith and with trust in the Holy Spirit. Why? because truth may be wearied, but it cannot be overcome. A half century ago, the Second Vatican Council told us this, that the church, like a stranger in a foreign land, presses forward amid the persecutions of the world and the consolations of God, and that by the power of the risen Lord, she's given strength that she might, in patience and in love, overcome her sorrows and her challenges, both within herself and from without, and that she might reveal to the world, faithfully, though darkly, the mystery of her Lord, until, in the end, it will be manifested in full light. My brothers and sisters, this is our faith. This is the faith of the Church and we are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, and God bless you.